Spirit, my heart is your home. The doors are open, blow through every room. I want to hear your voice. I want to feel you move. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessing of being able to gather this night. We ask, Lord, your blessing upon us in such a way as to open uh, all of our hearts and minds to uh, be receptive to the ways in which your Holy Spirit, I pray, will inspire me uh, with those words and insights into the sacrament of holy matrimony that will enable us all to grow in appreciation of this beautiful call that you give to most of humanity, a call which enables them to cooperate with you in order to bring new life into the world, but also to enables the couple to grow in holiness and to become an example to us all. And so bless us, Father, with the ears to hear, the eyes to see, the heart to receive, and the, and the desire to follow you. In this we pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, it's a great privilege for me to be here with all of you. My name is Father Scott Woods, as Bill was saying, I'm pastor here at Sacred Heart, new pastor. And uh, I'm happy to talk with you about the sacrament of holy matrimony. Years ago, I, I heard the news about this uh, gentleman who, uh, his wife, uh, they lived in an area where he was always worried because his wife would come around the corner near this body of water really fast. And he warned her, you know, be careful because I'm always afraid you'll, you'll mess up and you'll end up in the water. And, and you know, I don't swim, <laughs> you know. So he warned her and warned her. So whenever he heard her car zooming around, he would always look out. Well, one day the thing he feared the most happened. He saw her going too fast, lose control. Her car drives right into the water. Uh, without even thinking, he runs out of the house, runs across the field, jumps into the water, swims over to the car, gets her out of the car, gets her back to land, only to remember that there were crocodile in that water. And of course, he really had never learned how to swim. Love can sometimes enable us to do what we never imagined was possible to do. That is the love that God desires to exist within marriage. And that marriage is meant to be an example of because I always think uh, in some ways, uh, priests, it's much easier because, uh, you know, being married to Holy Mother Church and being, you know, God's perfect. So if there's a problem, it's me. In marriage, you guys have to go, how much is my fault? How much is her fault? <laughs> you know, and that can be a lot more difficult, as you know, those of you who are married, have been married, uh, know. And yet um, marriage is still, a, a, it's meant to be so much more than what our society thinks it is. It's first of all, what we call a vocation. Uh, sometimes when we think of that word, if you've heard that word vocation, everyone immediately thinks of priesthood. They think of me or, or the nuns, the sisters. But actually, the, everyone is called to a vocation. Most of humanity is called to the vocation of marriage, uh, established by our Lord uh, for our good, for our sanctification. Not just the sanctification of the married couple, but the sanctification of the children, the sanctification of the wider society. Because hopefully all of us have known, either from our parents or our neighbors or friends or somebody, a married couple that was like, wow. Oh, I've received so many blessings from that marriage. Uh, they inspire me to greatness, or they help me through this, or I could turn to them for that, or they make me want to have what they have, you know? And that, that shows a, a good marriage and what a marriage should be and, and what one should strive for. Now, of course, I'm sure that couple, too, would tell you their marriage is not perfect. There are no perfect marriages. There's marriages in progress, <laughs> and there's some that are stalled, and there's some moving backwards. But what does God really want to do is something very, very great. Because a vocation means, by being a vocation, it's a call from God that most uh, uh, people experience, that they does not, not only desire marriage, but then they discern, am I really called to that vocation? And if I'm called, then, they, then one should pray, Lord, send me, uh, not as it were, as in a way, some people think, oh, oh the right one. Now, be careful of that. The Christianity has never taught there's a soulmate. In other words, that's a dangerous thing where there's only one person who can fulfill me. No, yeah, yeah there is one person who can fulfill me. His name is God, <laughs> right? Um, no, but instead, a person with whom I can grow, a person with whom I can become a saint, 
I, I love that uh, when the, uh, the uh, last of the uh, uh, Austrian emperors, who's up for sainthood, Emperor Karl, uh, and him, when he married the Empress Zita, uh, as soon as they did their vows, when they turned to leave the church, he said, he turned to her and he said, now let us go and make each other saints. Now let us go and make each other saints. And as he got it, that God established this, not just that they might be happy in this life, but the vows themselves actually remind them, God wants this to be a preparation for the eternal life to come in heaven. And so from the earliest times in the Old Testament, God created man, and then out of man, that man was lonely, that man found himself not complete. And so we know in Scripture it talks about him taking a rib out of Adam, and Adam's name, if you know the Hebrew, actually changes at a certain point, and he, and he creates woman. And when Adam sees her, he goes, whoa, man. <laughs> You got it. <laughs> Woman. <laughs> Whoa, man. I mean, he's just so amazed by her. She was the only one of all the creatures. Remember, God created all the other creatures first. Some like to even say the reason God made, you know, if you notice from when God created, everything God makes gets more complex as it goes along. So you start off with all the, you know, the light and the dark and the creation and the plants and then the animals, then man, and then woman. <laughs> The most complex creature of them all. <laughs> and the most spectacular, right? At least that's what my mom always said. <laughs> and the smartest. And the smartest. <laughs> and so what you see here, in that, in the, and there's a beauty, there's a love between the two. And God, this is, the, this is right away, they are bound together. They are bonded in the first real marriage because God made them for each other and desired that there be a certain equality. Yes, Adam had a certain headship, but it's a headship of service for love of her. And the key thing is love. The key thing is love. Not just any love, but agape love, a sacrificial love. And that's why it's so sad when, of course, the fall happens. Because we see what sin does within marriage, what it still does within marriage. Uh, first of all, she's deceived by the serpent. She uh, uh, believes lies about God, which still people do today. And then suddenly, when, when Adam receives it, what happens is you see, first of all, a separation between them and God, and then between them and each other, and then between, even in a way, themselves. They lose in a way themselves. They're shame, and they hide away. But God searches for them. This is the whole of Scripture, is in that line. God is walking in the garden, searching for them, searching for you and me. And so he'll eventually establish this beautiful sacrament of marriage as a further aid to all of us to heaven. To all of us to heaven. Even for us who aren't married, uh, marriage is meant to be an aid to heaven. I mean, some of the married couples I know have been some of the greatest supports of me and my priesthood are when I was a younger person and pray God to a number of you, including my, my own parents and grandparents. But what do we see happen with, with the sin and the fall is a, is a corruption of the understanding of what marriage should be. Um, marriage in the ancient world was a large, you know, while the primary good the church teaches of marriage is procreation, the bringing forth of the fruit of life, it's not the only good. Because the other good is that helping each other grow in holiness. And we see this a number of times in Scripture when there are times when there's a woman who cannot even have a child. In the ancient world, most pretty much across the board, if she could not have a child, then, then, then the man would divorce her and marry someone else. But we have a number of, of patriarchs in the Old Testament who, like Abraham, is like, no, I love my wife, I will be faithful to her. And it's only when she finally, things get messed up, and I'll, that's a story for another day. <laughs> but um, earlier on, but when he was faithful to that, God rewarded them eventually with that child. Not that, that, not that it happens every case, but their love is what produces then that child. And so we see that men can marry in, that early, in those ancient times multiple wives, but it becomes a mess. Whenever you see this in the Old Testament, it never works out well. Usually there's one particular woman he wishes he could be married to alone, and the others then feel upset, understandably so. You know, so uh, this is why uh, you see our Lord later on when Jesus uh, is asked about this, you know, um, um, our, Lord, our Lord makes it clear, no, and from the beginning God meant there to be one man and one woman. Why? They are different, but the two, the two become one. And they complete one another, and they aid one another in becoming better. 
You know, if they're both seeking, especially the Lord, then you can aid one another in growing in holiness. You can aid one another in growing in, in, in so many virtues. I, I remember a couple I knew, uh, they, they had a number of kids. The guy had a great job and everything seemed to be going well. And uh, one day he came home and told his wife, you know, I'm really worried because my boss has told me that they're laying people off. This is after the, the, the dot com bust. And they're laying people off. And my boss called me in and said, I don't know how much longer I'm going to keep you on. You need to start looking for a new job. And so he started looking for a new job. And the one job he was able to find was his dream job back in the town where they were originally from. He thought, oh, she's going to be so happy. This is going to be perfect. So he goes and tells his wife, guess what? He tells her and she's like, oh, no. Because for her, that town was a dead end and, and she didn't have the support and her faith that she had where they lived presently. But it was interesting. She said, you know, but Father, I was able to tell him the truth and at the same time trust in him and his headship to say, but you know, if you feel this is the best thing for our family, I will trust that God will bless this. And so I'm open to it, even though it scares me to death. <laughs> and he was able to be honest with her. He said, Father, I was so angry that she wouldn't be rejoicing this, but I understood. I was trying to understand, but I also trusted that she knew too what was best for our family. And between the two... And then eventually God worked things out. They didn't move back. He took the chance, but God blessed them with what he needed. It wasn't what he wanted, but he said they gained from that, that back and forth, that, that to, to trust one another even more, to love each other even more, because love is really tested in times of trial and tribulation. Will I die to myself? Will I give of myself? Will I trust my spouse? And most of all, will I trust that God can bless us in the midst of it? And he said their, their love for one another grew deeper and stronger than ever before, even though there were some really tough days and tough conversations, as will happen in married life. I was eating dinner last night with a couple for, who's been married 65, no, 67 years. 67 years. And neither one killed each other. <laughs> but in fact, they're very loving. And not that life was easy. But what they did is they, this is why marriage is a covenant and a sacrament. Because when the Lord at the established marriage, and we see the establishment of it from the very beginning. As some of you, if you were at, at my homily at least, uh, when they had the wedding feast at Cana, I said, you know, Jesus' first miracle wasn't turning water, in, oh, uh, no, it was turning water, but it wasn't, it wasn't healing the sick or curing the blind or raising the dead. It was turning water into wine just to keep the party going. It was marriage. It was at this place that he established this is a holy thing. And therefore, from the earliest times in Christianity, it was seen as a holy union that's unbreakable. Something that should not be in any way uh, deterred, nor should it be broken. Unless very, very serious reasons why. And we'll go into some of those things that the church talks about. Um, but in this beautiful sacrament of marriage... Uh, what you see our Lord do is he's saying that this union is meant to bring about many, many graces. Because, again, uh, it's like almost like two rocks rubbing against one another. It can be tough, but it also can, can, can rub down the rough spots. Because the spouses can help each other to sometimes see, what, see or reflect back what you yourself can't see. Kind of like, you know, sometimes you need a friend to say, hey, your hair in the back is messed up. You can't see it, they can. Or how, how you can do something better, or a different angle. Because something I think one of the most beautiful things of marriage that I've seen as a spiritual director to marry many married couples over the years, is how they can, they, there's all, they're, if, the, if the marriage is going the way it should, they're always still discovering new things about the other. Little things that they, I, I just heard Caitlin at the office say, say her husband had some skill she didn't even know he had until the, I don't know if you noticed the St. Michael statue, the angel broke, the, wing, the one wing broke, or someone broke it. <laughs> and her husband was fixing, she said, I didn't even know he had that skill. I'm still discovering, you know, 12 years into marriage, new things. New things. Not just the, the skills, but new beauty, new goodness. And that's what the Lord wishes uh, to happen in marriage. Because marriage is also supposed to be a symbol of the love that our Lord has for his church. I like what St. Paul says in, the, in Ephesians here. This is Ephesians uh, chapter, and I don't have the right the chapter down. Okay, well, it's Ephesians. <laughs> 
Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and handed himself over for her to sanctify her, cleansing her by the bath water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. So also husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one hates his own flesh, but rather nourishes and cherishes it, even as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> third, no, oh. the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak in reference to Christ and the church. Wow, there's a lot packed in there of what marriage is meant to be. That, you know, the husband, some of the often times, uh, there's a focus, over-focus on, on obedience, but it says they should be obedient one to another. But this is at the core what God desires is a union of love. And now, when we think of love, too often we think of those initial emotional feelings. But remember that when Scripture speaks of love, it's not talking about the, the emotional feelings alone. Certainly that's a part of it. But any of you who've been married know the same emo those emotions that are so super strong in the day of, at that time start to cool somewhat. And then I like to say the bubble pops, and then the real marriage begins. This is where it becomes much more of a choice in terms of the little things they do for one another and the bigger things they choose to do and choosing to do things um, because it is the right thing for the person. I like the definition of love that says, love is the desire for the good of other or the other and I'm gonna do something about it. Let me say that again. Love is the desire for the good of the other and I'm gonna do something about it, even when I don't desire to do it, especially when I don't desire to do it because I have that choice of love. And that's what the Lord then starts to bring about in the married life. This beautiful choice where one can learn to die to themselves for love of the other. And that, when it happens, it really, really helps that person to become more human, to become more saintly, and then to really receive God's graces. Now, on our own, we can't do this because so often we do. We are tempted to a selfishness. We are tempted to, and this is what you see in the Garden of Eden eventually, right? When, when God says to uh, Adam and Eve, like, like, who told you you were naked? Adam blames. Who does he blame? The woman. The woman, but who does he really blame? God, exactly. He says, it was the woman you gave me. <laughs> it was the woman you gave me, this temptation. And so we, we, we have to recognize that's the way evil tries to work within the married life, within the covenant of marriage. And again, this is why we speak of marriage also then as a covenant, that it's not just a promise the spouses make to each other, but primarily to God himself. We will try to stick together and work things out. And again, I'm going to go through why this is not always possible. And the church does talk about that. If there's physical abuse, if there's a mental or emotional abuse, then that woman or man, and I've had both men and women who've gone through that, should separate. Uh, should separate because for the good, their own safety and good as well as that of their children. But there's still, there's a, still a bond there, that, and we'll talk about that further in a little bit too, uh, that exist, and that's why I can't be divorced and then remarry, but there might have to be a divorce, a legal divorce, in order for the person's safety. But in most marriages, what should really be happening, if, if both, and of course it takes two to tangle, that's why you want to be really discern who you're marrying, if you young people, <laughs> really think about who you're going to marry because, uh, you know, people change and they grow. And hopefully, if they're already a person of faith and on the road, then, then that growth with God's help can really flourish. But if that person is already making really, really bad decisions and not being honest and not loving you and really loving you and showing love in the, in the proper way, watch out. It doesn't always get better like in the movies, right? Um, and so that's why it's so important to really make sure that, that you're making, because you notice that what the vows are in the marriage, for better or for worse, for better or for worse. 
And that doesn't just mean from the outside circumstances, that's also talking about that person you're marrying. Because <laughs> you're going to see them, as all of you who are married know, you're going to see them at their best, and you're going to see them at their worst, and you have to still be committed to love them. And again, this is separate from physical or mental abuse, which is a whole other thing where that should not be put up with. But if it's just that they're in a really bad, bad mood, which all of us at times are, and not acting the way they should, you're, okay, I'm still, I'm still going to seek to be loving towards this person. And that again requires the love of, that requires the grace of God. That's why marriage should never be entered into lightly. That's why the church says, in fact, uh, we're going to give you all these helps to your married life. Um, we're going to give you the, the sacrament of reconciliation for when you mess up. Sometimes people come to me, they're, they're telling me about, and my spouse did this, my spouse did that. I'm like, okay, but what about, what did you do? <laughs> what did you do, right? So be careful talking about other people in confession. Uh, the other great help, of course, is the Eucharist. The Eucharist is a massive help. If you're frequently receiving our Lord in Holy Eucharist, he will help and aid your marriage in a stronger and stronger way. I knew a couple, actually, that... Um, they were having a really tough time in marriage over a number. They were married for almost about 50 years. And I remember the guy saying to me, Father, it has been tough. It's been really, really tough. But he started, because of it, he started going to adoration, Eucharistic adoration, and spending time an hour a week with the Blessed Sacrament or more. And his wife started to notice he became more patient and more kind and more loving. She said, wow, if this is happening to him. Let me get some of that. So she started going with him. And then suddenly... Uh, the two of their kids started noticing they were getting along better and they weren't nipping at each other as much and they weren't uh, having as much struggle. And it was a beautiful, transformed their married life. Sadly, she had cancer eventually. But a beautiful, beautiful death um, that really shaped both of them in a powerful way. And not too long later, he met a woman at adoration and they found love together. <laughs> so the Lord gives these beautiful helps to your married life. But it's our choice whether to take them or not. You know, are we living a married life? Are those of you who are called already or will be called to marry? Are you living it like it's just a, a contract? Or am I living it as a covenant? Now, what, what's the difference there? Uh, of course, in the marriage ritual, especially if, uh, for Catholics, this, uh, this vocation of marriage, this sacrament, which is the outward sign of an inward grace, you may, marriage is a covenant. Now, interesting enough, marriage is the only sacrament of the church that's not performed primarily by the priest. It's the only sacrament of the church where I'm a witness, the primary witness, but the ministers of the sacrament are the married couple. The man and the woman are the actual ministers of the sacrament. Sometimes even to emphasize this, you'll, you'll see in marriages where the priest will have the couple stand up on the steps and he'll stand down from it. So the full focus is on the couple as the minister. They're ministering the sacrament of marriage to each other by their free giving of one another in their vows. And at that moment, they become married. They become yoked to one another. And remember, they're primarily making it. This is why marriages are normally in church. Uh, they're primarily making this vow to God himself. It's to God himself that they're making this promise. But then God makes a promise to all of you who are married or will be married one day. I will, if you are open to it, give you an abundance of grace to get you not only through, um, but so that, you, so that you survive, but that you thrive. Remember, God doesn't want us just to survive. He wants us to thrive. He wants us to grow. He wants us to be even more receptive to his grace, his love, and his mercy so that we live it out, not just when things are easy in marriage, but also when things are difficult. Also, when the trials come, then the Lord will give you the grace to more and more be perfected in the midst of it. And that's why the covenant of marriage is such a powerful example of love in the world. And when you uh, see or experience or if you yourself are starting to live a married life the way God desires, if you're praying together and, and staying together and loving together and working together and serving together, then what begins to happen more and more is that love grows deeper and stronger and the union between the two uh, grows so that it, that it overflows, that love overflows First of all, pray God and be God's will and physical children. 
um, which, and, and then eventually also, but even for those who don't have our children. I knew a couple when I was in the University of Scranton, and they just weren't, they were not able to have children. Um, but I would say they became parents of many spiritual children. Uh, their married love uh, enabled them to really give themselves to their students. They were both professors, and they would invite us over for all sorts of different stuff. And we felt like we were in a family home that was our home. And they had a powerful effect on many, many young people uh, who wanted to, who used them as a model of married love, or who used them and saw from from that love and, and holiness of their lives and enabled them to the other vocations of priesthood and religious life. And so that's what God can do, even when you're not perhaps blessed with physical children. God will always send you spiritual children who can then gain from your married love. Um, as I've preached about before, I felt in my life that there have been many, many spiritual mothers and fathers whom God has placed in my life to strengthen me, to advise me, to correct me, and to encourage me when I needed it. And some of the best have been some of these really holy um, men and women who are married. They're not perfect. They'll be the first to tell you that, but they're striving. They're striving towards not perfection, but excellence. And they recognize that God is forgiving them, is offering them by frequently in the sacraments of confession and, and Holy Eucharist, the graces they need to live a, a good married life. And so I would like to say that their, their marriage is also, which is meant to be a, a reflection of the Trinity. I'm not sure if you've met, re, reached the uh, Trinity yet, but uh, God is Trinity. But one of the best examples of God is Trinity I can possibly give that I, I believe comes from the Eastern Church is God in the, all eternity pouring out all of his love to God the Son. God the Son pouring that love back to the Father. The love between the two being the Holy Spirit in this eternal, and that we're invited into this eternal procession of love. And that marriage is meant to be such as that. And of course, the, the life between the, between the two substantially is usually one's physical children, but really if it's lived fully, also the spiritual children again. I, I've buried a number of people from this church uh, uh, who were married, and a number of times uh, the, the kids would say, oh yeah, our house was the house that the neighborhood kids would come to and want to just, you know, not leave because our parents had such love that everyone felt like they were part of our family. You know, that, that in certain sense, uh, that again, is something that can happen with God's grace. Um, now I want to go through a little more to the ends of marriage again. That in marriage we have this, these two primary goods of the, of, the, of the beginning of children, rearing of children, but also the mutual good of the spouses. Um, because as those of you who, are, who, who know older couples, they were parents to children for maybe 20-something, 30 years, and now we're all living a lot longer. So that means there's going to be a lot more years without the kids. A lot more years in which to hopefully grow in love and to grow in holiness together. And that requires a real mindset of, of, uh, of fruitfulness that the Lord wants to work with in the married life. Now... I mentioned before about reasons why the church might allow for or say even that there needs to be um, a divorce. And again, physical or mental or emotional abuse is certainly a reason. The church, uh, the catechism says, Today there are numerous Catholics in many countries who have recourse to civil divorce and contracts and contract new civil unions. And fidelity to the words of Jesus Christ, whoever divorces his wife, and marries another, commits adultery against her. If he divorces her husband, she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. The church maintains that a new union cannot be recognized. In other words, even if there is a divorce for just reasons, that doesn't mean there can be a remarriage. Because again, that, that was made as a covenant. But we do might, you might have heard that there's a process in the, and called annulment. Um, and this is the church's recognition, and it comes from scripture, of what's called unlawful marriage. Because what makes a marriage, um, what's what primarily must be there, is free consent. A free consent of both people. 
So if there were outside pressure to marry, once, once I had a couple that came to me, um, the, the woman when she was a, a, teen, a late teens found herself pregnant and her parents were like, you better marry this man, otherwise all these horrible things will happen. So she had so much pressure that she didn't get to freely choose her spouse. And the church was able to easily say, that was an invalid marriage. You cannot, there cannot be outside pressure. And hence, we have to go through a whole thing of questions. When I, whenever a couple comes to me to get married in the church, I have to separate them at one point. I have to ask each of them the same questions. Like, are you being, are you being forced are you being like uh, like threatened? Are um, are there other unright uh, you know things like that? Uh, do you really know this person? You know and things like that to make sure they know who they're marrying. If uh, or if the, sometimes I had a one woman I remember I married the couple. They it seemed like a great couple. Everything was going well, but the guy presented himself like an entirely different person than he really was. He presented himself like he was this wonderful, good Catholic guy, when in reality he was a, he was he was a monster. And only after she married him did he show the real him. And he was having affairs on her and watching pornography and all these things that are clearly contrary. And he had no intention. And so that was a clear case where the church was able to easily say once they did the investigation that no, this man she married she married a man that did not exist. And that's why the church was able to say, no, this was not a valid marriage, and therefore you are free to remarry. And that's what an omen is. It's a recognition of a reality that we thought existed for a time, and now once the investigation, when the church does it, once we look through everything, we recognize, no, there's something invalid. Or sometimes it can happen again if a Catholic marries a non-Catholic, uh, especially a non-Christian without permission. That's uh, because the Catholics have to marry within the church or get permission to be married by another minister, which can happen. The bishop can give permission. But if that doesn't happen, then that marriage is invalid. It is not a valid marriage, and therefore it can be annulled uh, more easily. So those are some of the reasons for annulments that might happen. Unfortunately, because so many people are, are even not fully aware of what marriage is today, I would say there's a lot more annulments today than there used to be. Just as there's a lot more divorce, because I think a lot of times people don't really fully understand um, what marriage is. And that's why we've, we've tried here to give you a little tiny taste. There's a lot more we, we're going to give you in terms of literature. Um, is there anything you think I might have left out? Uh, no, you covered what I had. <clears throat> Are there any questions that you guys might have about marriage? Anything you ever wanted to ask? Yes. So marriage means it's a union, for, so as a Catholic definition, basically, a, union, a, a, a covenant union between a man and a woman who vow that they will stay together uh, to, for the rest of their lives, that they'll be together for the rest of their lives, and they vow their marriage before, before a priest. So they're standing in front of a priest, and they're making their promises to God before the priest. That's kind of like simple, that more, you know. Does that help? <laughs> yeah, it does. I, I feel I didn't want to read you a definition because even I'm like, what? <laughs> Any other questions? That's a very good one. That's a more, very important one to have. So I hope you see that uh, just the, the beauty of marriage. For, for Catholics, uh, marriage is just one of the most beautiful sides. It's equal in dignity to that of priesthood and religious life. It is, it is the one that... Um, last all the way to death. That's something I should have also emphasized. Marriage does end as a, a particular union with death. That's why one can remarry if your spouse dies, because that's it. in heaven. There is no no one is given in marriage, or, or uh, there is no marriage in heaven because we have ultimate union with God, and our Lord and His and blessedness gives us a fulfillment way beyond what any union of this earth can give us. So some people say, well, will I still have a particular love for my spouse? You will, you will love your spouse, but you will have a love, you will be able to love in a way much higher than you ever could here on earth. You will love your spouse and even your worst enemy more than you could ever imagine here on earth. That's, that's the wonderful thing about heaven. That's the wonderful thing about heaven. So I hope I, hope I did a good job. I haven't done one of these talks in a good while. It was great to be with all of you. And if you have any further questions, um, also our, our books or articles we can give you, love to love to do that also. 
Say with the prayer in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for uh, giving us this time again. We ask you to see each person here home safely, uh, to give to each of them a peaceful night's rest. They may rise strong in faith, hope, and love, and strive to continue to know you, to love you, and to serve you in the coming days as they prepare for the Holy Sacrament of Baptism, Confirmation, First Communion, and uh, for those who are going to prepare for their first confession. And this we pray in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.